less to, uh, to look like that. Um, and, and this is very visually different from that. Okay? That's nice. That's great. Okay? That's a sign of a good, clear hypothesis. It doesn't have to be expressed in graphical form, but that, that really is not a bad way of doing it at all. Um, and similarly, you know, it's like, well, it could be this or it could be that. You know, it, this, this figure would be a lot less clear if there were like six different possibilities and, um, you know, it, you couldn't really just tell just by eyeballing what, you know, what the difference is. Like here you can really clearly tell, aha, the red's always higher than the green. You know, they're both higher here, but the red's always higher than the green. Here the red's lower than the green, here it's higher than the green. I get it, that's what the difference is. It's something about red things being higher or lower than green things. Now then you have to look a bit more carefully and say, well, hang on, what is the red? Oh, it's predicted or unpredicted. But, you know, in the blink of an eye, you can say, aha, hypothesis two is actually saying something different from hypothesis one. Um, so, so that's, so that's, that's what, what to aim for now. Uh, you know, these are not, these are not easy things to do. So I do not for one minute think, you know, you have to like produce some, something which, you know, without modification could be submitted to an SF or an IH and they'd give you a million bucks. Obviously that would be great. And in fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if somebody did do that. But, um, but you know, just, but these, these are things to aim for. And I would say, you know, the more you can, the more you can uh, achieve this, the more, the more I'll think, hey, this is a great project. Now, one very interesting idea that was uh, suggested to me by, by one of you guys was uh, how about getting feedback from the class by giving an elevator pitch? Now, have any of you, I, I, I think it's a very interesting idea, but I, do, 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 you know, do you guys know what an elevator pitch is? Some, probably some of you. It's basically, you know, you're in the, you're in the company, you're in, you know, you, you, you're in the lobby of the company and you find yourself in the elevator with the CEO and you're going to be in the elevator with them for the next, you know, 30 seconds, and you have you, you might never see the CEO ever again because it's a huge company, and you have that long to say to them, "Hey, I've got this really good idea, and I was thinking about this, and how about that?" And then, ding, you reach the floor, and he's like, "Okay, well, thanks. I'll get back to you. Bye." Um, so it's basically having a very rapid and compressed version of uh, of your idea, and telling it to people, and then getting feedback. Now, uh, that's also kind of a hard thing to do. So don't worry, I'm not going to make you do an elevator pitch because that's a whole separate thing. But if you want to, that, I think that would be great. You know, if you want to do that and if you think you know, that would be a good way of getting feedback from people in the class, then I welcome that. And, um, and I know at least one or two of you want to do that and we, you know, we can make some time in one of the classes. There wouldn't even be time for all of you to do that anyway. Just, you know, even if an elevator pitch is just a couple, you know, just literally 90 seconds and a couple of minutes of feedback, you know, if you multiply that by 25 or whatever it is, it would just be too much. But uh, if you want to do that, then that would be great. Um, if you don't want to, don't worry, that's totally fine. Uh, so anyway, uh, I know I know that at least one or two of you are interested in doing that, and we can make the time to do that. Um, okay, so that's that's my little spiel about <coughs> about what I'm hoping for in the project. And does that sort of answer? Some of the questions that you had. I'm sure there's more questions. You can post them. This, this, by the way, I'd like to thank um, Jarrett, who I'm not sure if he's here now, but that's fine. He already has made a great contribution because he basically posted this question to Piazza and said, "Hey, you know, I'd like to know the answer to these things," and I'm grateful for him doing that. So, you know, if you have other, um, you know, other questions, you can post them, or uh, you know, you can ask me, and it's my job to to try and help to make this whole process a bit clearer. But, um, but if you're kind of feeling a bit lost in the need of an anchor, take these three things as your anchor, um, is my suggestion. So anyway, there are any more questions about the class project? I know some of you have sent like uh, emails to me about it in the last couple of days. Um, I'll be answering those. And uh, yeah, and I would encourage you if you want, if you'd like to meet with me, then we'll find time to meet. It probably won't be in the next few days, but it will be soonish. Um, but we can do a lot by email too. Okay. Okay, let's talk about attention and prediction. Uh, and there's actually a reason why I'm particularly interested in attention and prediction, because I'm currently very fortunate to be sort of starting to think about collaboration with Florian, who's back in Dave, 
trying to make this uh, student thinking about these very interesting issues. So I'm kind of trying to work this out in my own head, and we, we're having discussions about this. So, so uh, these are kind of interesting topics that nobody really knows the, the answers to. I mean, this is true for kind of the whole cognitive neuroscience. It's interesting topics that nobody really knows the answer to. Um, but I think it's even more true in this. And these are very kind of new and live and open questions. Uh, now, I, I think there's some I think there's a law that you're not allowed to talk about attention in a psychology department without make, having this William James quote. Um, but it is kind of a good quote. Do, do, you, do you know who William James was? He was like a, a, uh, one of the really kind of early founders of psychology. He was at Harvard. The Harvard Psychology Department building is named after him. His brother was uh, Henry James, the famous novelist. And uh, anyway, he wrote the book Principles of Psychology. He also wrote a book about varieties of religious experience. He just, you know, was like a very key early figure. And uh, he really knew how to write, too. So he has this nice quote. Uh, OK. Everybody knows what attention is. It's the taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seems several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. That's very important, that bit. OK, there's several possible things, and you kind of select one of them, right? That is really a key part of attention. Um, this next bit is really, it implies withdrawal from some things in order to deal effectively with others. That's another really key part of attention. I mean, you know, he, he, he uh, there's a reason why people quote this a lot. Okay? So when you're trying to boil down your question to these kind of three opening sentences, one of the many reasons why that's difficult what are you trying to do? You're trying to get the attention of the reader. And one of the reasons why it's difficult is because to select things down to those three sentences is a lot that you have to not put in those three sentences. Okay? So attention is not only the selection process, but it's also the kind of exclusion process. Okay? In fact, uh, well, we'll talk about this a bit more later, but it's literally the case that um, William James had no way of knowing this. But it's literally the case that attentional signals have been found to have what's called an on-center, off-surround structure, which literally means that the thing that gets attended gets enhanced, um, greater excitation, greater neural activation, and its neighbors, the other things that are not being attended, get inhibited, they go down. So if you were to turn this, these words into a kind of simple circuit model, okay, then, then it would be, OK, well, that thing that gets uh, that thing, we're going to have an excitatory connection going down onto the thing that's being attended, and we're going to have inhibitory connections around that, suppressing the other stuff, and that's actually literally what happens. So it's kind of impressive that William James sort of figured that out, um, you know, just without having any of that data. Uh, and it's a condition, which, now this is another interest, this is kind of a different aspect of attention. It's a condition which is the real opposite in the confused days scatterbrain state. I love the way he writes. Um, so it's not just that you're selecting something and excluding something, but there's a sense in which you're in a whole different state, right? An attentional state, this is sort of getting at the top down and bottom up aspects of attention. So say I want to, you know, there's like many people in this room, and say I want to attend to just one of you. Well, first of all, I'm going to move my eyes to one of you, okay? Uh, or say I want to attend, so I'm not staring at someone, say I want to attend to the clock, right? And ignore uh, all the other stuff in the room. Okay, I'm like, okay, it's five past four, so, you know, I better get going onto some more slides, okay? So, so the first thing I know, I'm moving my eyes to the clock, okay? So now I've got more, more neural processing of the clock, less neural processing of everything else, so that's kind of how my attention is going out there on the world. Remember we were talking about a receptive field as something out there in the world that's driving neural activation. Um, so, you know, receptive fields out there in the world that happen to be taking in information about that clock, they're going to get enhanced now. But there's also this kind of top-down sense of I have this goal, aha, I need to see what time it is. Right? I'm, before I was just in a confused, dazed, and scatterbrained state, and then suddenly I thought, oh, wait, wait, boom, what time is it? Mm -hmm. There's the clock. Okay? So there's this kind of top-down, goal-directed sense, and then there's this kind of stimulus selection sense. So there's actually kind of a lot going on in this quote. I mean, you know, it's, uh, and there's, there's lots of other, 
for almost any area of psychology that you want to investigate, there's a really good William James quote for it. So that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that speaks well to, uh, to what he did. Now, despite the fact that that quote captures a lot, people are still hugely arguing about what attention is. In fact, people are actually even arguing about whether attention is even a thing, whether attention is even real. Is attention even a useful way of thinking about things? This is actually, these are live discussions happening right now, which are kind of actually fun. Um, there's been a long movement in, uh, in uh, cognitive psychology, which was really dominant, especially in like the 20s and 30s, to say, let's try not to talk too much about these kind of mysterious internal things that you can't really directly get a handle on, because, you know, that's just like kind of positing ghosts in the machine. Let's just kind of keep things concrete. Let's keep things, you know, connected to stuff that we can actually measure. And that's actually a very reasonable approach because you can, the more directly tied to stuff you can measure things are, the more likely you are to actually, you know, stay on track. Probably the field, in, especially in the 20s and 30s, took it too far by just saying it's, you know, forbidden to talk about any internal processes. That turned out to be a little bit of a, um, of an excessive restriction, but trying to keep things concrete is often a good idea. So suppose you don't like the word attention. You could say, well, it's task relevance. Okay? So if I'm, if I if I rephrase the the sentence, I wanted to figure out what time it was, so I attended to the clock. Okay, and you you could cross out the word attention, and you could say, you know, I wanted to see what time it was, so I directed my gaze to the most task-relevant object in the room. Okay? So of all the different things I could be looking at right now, if my task is what time it is, really the relevant thing is that clock over there. Okay? Um, and then there's all kinds of other questions. So I've just put these up just to kind of illustrate that, uh, that this is a very kind of active area. Um, I'm going to show in a minute that uh, Attention might seem very kind of fuzzy and ill-defined and like this kind of, you know, strange inner feeling that you sort of sense. But you can actually, you know, find very direct neural measures of it, amazingly direct neural measures of it. So there's something real going on. Uh, but anyway, some of the questions that people ask are, you know, is it related to consciousness? Like if you attend to something, does that mean you have to be conscious of it? If you're conscious of something, does that mean you're attending to it? That's actually a very active debate right now. Is there even a single thing called attention? Are there actually lots of different things? I'm going to show an example of at least two different types of attention. Can you pay attention to two different things at once, or multiple different things? That's, some, that's an interesting question. Is it like a spotlight? People think of attention as this sort of metaphor of sort of searching around and just kind of shining a light on the thing that you're interested in. Believe it or not, you can actually, that may be more than a metaphor. You, people have actually done studies of, you know, proper psychophysical measurements of how wide is the spotlight, does it shrink, does it grow? I mean, it might seem like a metaphor, but in some cases it may be, it may be real. Okay, so these are, um, these are some questions about attention. Now there's this very related thing, which may or may not, the question of exactly how related it is is a very interesting and open question, which is expectation. Um, and there's lots and lots of open questions about expectation too. So now why, why might attention and expectation have anything to do with each other? Well, suppose I say to you, uh, there's about to be, you know, someone with a, a red hat is about to walk into the room and I want you to press a button the moment you see them, okay? So all of, a, all of a sudden now you're attending, you have this kind of top-down, goal-directed, attentional template of, I'm looking for someone wearing a red hat. Okay? And in fact, uh, you, if someone were to go and look at your brain, then um, neurons and brain areas that are responsive to color would actually be more active at this point. Okay? So there would be re very concrete um, correlates of that. And so now, okay, now you're attending to you know, the color red and maybe like red that's on top of someone's head, maybe the shape of a hat. Okay? Um, but you also have an expectation, right? I've now given you the expectation, aha, uh -huh, I expect that someone wearing a red hat is about to walk into the room. So these two seem actually very tightly interlinked here, right? You can't, you can't really ask somebody to attend to the fact to, you know, look for a guy in a red hat 
without giving them an expectation that there's going to be someone with a red hat about to come in. But I'll, we'll, we'll have a look in a minute at an interesting fMRI study that tries to pull those apart. Um, lots of questions about this, which in fact people in this department look at quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, so this is like one of my most interesting like things that I'm interested in is oh, attention and like failures or failures of attention mm -hmm. and how does failures of attention or misguided attention uh, help us shape how we understand attention itself. So oh, something like ADHD, is uh, that response inhibition? Is that executive function disorder? Right. Is it a failure of this concept called attention? Mm. Or is it expectation and reward and you're fixated on a reward and that's how you're attending? Right, right. Or another thing is related to expectation and attention is persistence. Uh. Because you can't persist and maintain this attention looking for a red hat without constantly being vigilant on what you're looking for. Absolutely. Um, that, 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 that's a beautiful description I mean, where you just really nicely described how there's m several different concepts, related but different concepts, persistence, control, executive function, different types of attention. They're all interrelated and sort of wrapped up with each other. And um, yeah, I mean, I, and I, that was a beautiful description. And I think that sort of shows expectation is wrapped up with it too. And this is kind of the, you know, the, the joy and the, um, and the, uh, you know, the headache of cognitive neuros neuroscience sort of in a nutshell, right? This is not something where everything is very clear cut. This is an area in which you have to have to kind of think quite carefully about, well, are there, you know, are these things different from each other? Are there actually things that sort of look at first glance like they're the same, but actually turn out to be importantly different if you kind of pull them apart in the right way and what would be the right way to pull them apart and um, and the study of something like uh, attention deficit disorder is a, is a perfect illustration of that because there's probably quite a lot of things going on in ADHD um, and they may or may not all be you know um, handled by the same kind of neural systems they may respond differently to different types of treatment different types of medication different types of behavioral intervention so it, it, thinking carefully about how these things are related is, is really important. So and thank you, That's, that was a very nice uh, description of that. So, so expectation in itself also has a lot going on. And so people, uh, people such as uh, Florian and um, Dick Haslin and others uh, study a lot about you know, how do people, how do babies, how do adults form expectations about what's going to be happening next. How does the brain represent them? These are very, very live and interesting questions. And in fact, actually, I'm not really sure if any of you study memory. I think some of you sort of study memory in some shape or form. Um, people in memory are actually very interested in uh, prediction and uh, the, the role of expectation prediction in memory these days, too. So if you say, well, we know what's memory for? Well, a very reasonable response would be, well, yeah, it's from remembering the past, right? Well, that seems like so obvious as to be almost not worth stating. Um, but actually, a lot of people don't think about memory this way anymore, it turns out. I mean, no one denies that memory is useful for remembering the past, right? But in terms of, you know, suppose I'm, you know, we're all organisms trying to survive and reproduce and, you know, survive, go on to continue in evolution. So from a natural selection point of view, you know, natural selection doesn't really care very much about whether you can kind of sit by the fire and fondly recall your childhood days. It cares about what you're going to do next and are you going to you know, survive, are you going to reproduce. Um, so in that sense, you know, all that matters is what you're going to do next. Uh, the purpose, so in that sense, the purpose of memory is to predict the future and the only reason you can remember anything about the past is so that you can actually use that as a basis for predicting the future. So there's actually this entire lines of research now based upon this kind of prospective view of memory, which in some ways is saying the same thing, right? right? Both of these involve using the past, obviously, because it's memory. But it's a slightly different way of thinking about what it's for, involved in prediction. So prediction is, very, uh, is, is kind of a very uh, hot topic these days. So, so let's look a little bit at um, how people look at some of these questions with fMRI, um, and also how they look at it with behavior. And one of the things I've been trying to emphasize is that it's really amazing how much you can get from behavior. So, so you know, this is again one of the criteria that I sort of mentioned for your project. 
it would be worth um, if you're doing a project relate on, on you know relating to <coughs> behavior, which by the way you don't have to. Um, I was chatting with uh, with a couple of people that you know if it's connected to the brain or it's connected to you know MRI in some way, that's fine. It doesn't have to be aligned with you know the stuff that I personally happen to be interested in. So there's you know that you could be in, for instance looking at something about. You know, which would be more of interest to say a neurologist, right? Of uh, you know, disorder of the brain such as stroke. Um, you know, nothing that I've talked about so far in this class is about what happens to your brain when you have a stroke. But that's a perfectly valid topic, completely valid. Or you know, so um, okay. So so here's an example of uh, of a very nice attentional task. Uh, and uh, this was devised by a guy called Mike Posner, who is. You know, one of the most important living cognitive psychologists. He's quite old now, but he's still active, actually. Um, and it's a wonderfully simple task. It's just so simple. Now, I pulled this picture of Wikipedia. It's actually not a very good picture, so I'm going to try and, uh, you know, it, it may or not all be visible, so I'll just kind of talk you through it. And this is also, by the way, relevant to um, to your project. So, so it turns out that the really key element in this picture here is a really tiny little arrow here with a tiny little arrow head on it that you can't even see. So I stuck a big arrow on top so you can actually see what the arrow is. So uh, you know, make sure that the key pieces of information are uh, you know, salient, that they come out here. OK, so, so, so there's a kind of these jargon terms here, endogenous and exogenous. So you know, if you do. You know, these kind of things turn up also in medicine a bit. So endo basically means from within, and exo means from without. So um, an easier way to think of these is um, endogenous is like something that comes from inside you. In other words, like task task driven or goal driven. So if I you know if you, if I say to you, there's about to be someone with a red hat walking in, press a button as soon as you see them. Now I've given you this kind of internal goal. Aha! I'm looking for a person with a red hat. So, so here's an example, a very, very simple uh, and you know, extreme. It, simplicity is sort of its power here. Okay? So you keep your eyes fixed on some point, And all you know is that some stimulus, in this page, case, is a picture of a star, could be anything, <coughs> is going to flash up either to the right or to the left, in this instance, of where you're currently keeping your eyes fixed. And some arrow in the middle that here, you know, whoever made this, if any of you feels like improving Wikipedia, you know, make a version of this figure with a bigger arrow, okay? Um, the, um, uh, there's an arrow that comes in the middle that said, that in this case points to the right, and it turns out that that's actually where the stimulus is going to be, okay? So, so you see this arrow and you think in this kind of internal cognitive way, hmm, the stimulus is going to come to the right, because that's where the arrow is pointing. OK, I'm going to direct my attention to the right. And it's worth pointing out that you've got to keep your eyes still on this central point. So although where you put your eyes and visual attention are very strongly linked, you can pull them apart by kind of making sure people keep their eyes fixed. Okay. So your sort of your William james -y sort of inner selective process, whatever that might be, is saying, mm hmm, I better attend to the right. And then it actually turns out that when something appears, you know, where the, the arrow was pointing, you respond to it more quickly, more accurately. The nice thing is that you can also do the, the converse of you can, so this is called a valid cue because, you know, it points to the right and the thing actually is going to come to the right. Uh, you can also do the converse where you can say, okay, here's an arrow, and in this case, obviously it could point any direction, but I'm just for illustration trying to point, points to the right, but then, you know, that mean old experimenter then puts the uh, stimulus on the left. So, um, so just as uh, you're faster and more accurate if your cue, your task-driven cue, your endogenous cue in the kind of jargon term, was pointing in the direction where the stimulus actually did turn out to be, if it points in the opposite direction and kind of deliberately, you know, kind of puts you on the false scent, then you're slower and you're less accurate. And as you might also imagine. Uh, if you have a cue that is completely uninformative, you're kind of in between. Okay? So this is incredibly simple, but this turns out, you know, no one had kind of thought of this before. Pose I, I think it was in 1980. Uh, um, 
this is a very, very nice way of saying to what degree can people kind of steer around their internal, if you like the metaphor of an attentional spotlight, you can, you can think, okay, I'm sort of moving my attentional spotlight to where the, where the arrow goes. Okay. Now that's one way of getting attention. Okay. But there's other ways of getting attention, and the world does this to us all the time, right? So, uh, you know, you're just minding your business, and then suddenly, right, what? What was that? Okay, you know, some, something goes bump, and that bump makes you jump. So I have a toddler, and we'll be reading Dr. Seuss. And, uh, uh, you know, it grabs your attention, okay? And uh, so you can literally... People have actually said you can literally yank someone's attention away, even if they're trying not to. If something, so if it's like an auditory thing that goes bump, suddenly your auditory attention is going over there. If it's a visual thing, you, you can get the same thing with a flashing light, right? Or just any kind of s sudden onset. Uh, and um, you can do that with almost exactly the same setup. So in this time, instead of the attentional cue being some arrow at the center that kind of steers your internal, kind of internal attentional spotlight, suddenly something just flashes in the periphery. Flash! And that flash literally grabs your attention. And, um, and if something comes up in the, in the location where that flash happens, so here, you know, a square flashes up, it has to be like a sudden onset for it to grab your attention, then if something comes up where the flash has happened, you're faster and more accurate at responding to it. And these are very, very robust effects. This has been replicated you know, probably thousands of times. Um, and then you can do exactly the same thing if the flash happens in the wrong place. Now you're slower and less accurate when a stimulus comes up where the flash wasn't. Okay? So this is a beautifully simple way of manipulating attention. There's lots of other ways of manipulating attention, but this is one of the the really classic ones, and this is still used to this day. Okay. Um, Can you just explain again how that's the difference between endogenous and ex... ex yeah, okay, sure. So endogenous, endogenous attention, the arrow comes up, but you have to engage in some internal process that says, hmm, I'm seeing this arrow, so I guess I'm going to move my attentional spotlight over here. And that actually turns out to take longer, right? Then where it was the exogenous, meaning coming from outside, is something that goes <coughs> bang and flash, that just kind of hits at you, and that will grab your attention actually very quickly. People have measured the time course of these things in very beautiful behavioral studies. Um, very quickly, all of a sudden, your attention is over at this place, whether you want it or not. Okay? You don't have to at all think, hmm, I think I better steer my attention over there. It just goes over there. And it's, and it's very much like, it's exactly like, you know, you, um, uh, you know, you're walking down the street and suddenly, you know, I don't know, there's, you know, a car bumps into a lamppost on the other side of the street or something. Can you, hmm? what's that? Okay. You're not thinking, ooh, I think I just heard a car bump into a lamppost. I think I might look and go see what it is, right? The, right. the bang happens and it's an involuntary thing. And unless you're like incredibly engrossed in what you're currently doing, Suddenly, you're attending to that. It's like an oyster, an orienting response. Okay, and uh, so so the key difference is whether it's driven from within or whether it's driven from without, endogenous or exogenous. And the driven from within one is typically about what task you're doing. So it usually requires some kind of, you know, internal effort and kind of control. Um, and the uh, the exogenous one, the one from outside, is typically driven by some stimulus. Typically, something that's kind of, you know loud or bright, and in particular, it has to have a sudden onset. Okay? So you know, why does, why does a, a, you know, a car crashing into a lamppost grab your attention? Because you know, it's quiet, 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 and then loud. Okay? If the car kind of, I don't know, is like slowly backing up and is already pushing against the lamppost and is sort of kind of gradually squeezing more and more against you, know, so it's this, a sound that just kind of starts off quiet and then gradually gets louder. That won't grab your attention nearly, nearly the same way. And this you, you kind of know from your everyday experience. If something just goes bang, crash, it's going to grab your attention. So that's the exogenous uh, stimulus-driven one. Okay, so that's a nice way of uh, of looking at attention. It's not the only way, but it's a nice way. What about prediction, which at first might seem kind of different? So prediction is one of these things where 
which is actually very unusual in neuroscience, that there's actually a very, very direct, actually maybe less direct than people initially thought, but to, to a first approximation, there's a very, very direct neural correlate of um, prediction and expectation. And this is, this is a really you know, useful thing to, to know about, even if you're uh, um, you know, not interested in uh, some of the you know, more kind of fuzzy topics. And, and what's beautiful about this is that it really fits incredibly closely with our intuitions. Okay? So, you know, suppose it, it's, uh, it's, your, you know, it's your birthday, and your best friend says, hi, how are you doing? You're kind of expecting that they may be going to give you a card or a present or something. Okay? And, uh, and they say, hey, how are you doing? Happy birthday, here's a card. You're like, oh, thank you so much, that's so nice. Okay? Um, suppose it's your birthday, and you see your best friend, and they don't say anything. And you're like, ah, they're just you know saving it as a surprise, right? And then they're like, okay, see you later. And then they go, and they still don't say anything. They're like, oh, well, I thought I'd get a card. No. Um, okay. So then you feel disappointed. Okay. And then, uh, you know, suppose it's not your birthday. Okay. And your best friend comes along, and they're like, hey, um. Have this. And you're like, what? what what's this? And they're like, ah, oh, just because I think you're such a great person, I thought I'd give you this present. And you're like, oh, that's so nice. Okay. So, so these very intuitive uh, examples uh, are actually directly reflected in uh, literally individual neurons in, uh, in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra. And this was shown by a person called Wolfram Schultz. And he wrote this article on his website, which you can look if you want more detail. So, so these neurons literally respond exactly like this. So, um, this is the case where, um, so if you're not familiar with reading these kind of diagrams, each one of these, I know some of you make these diagrams like all day and all night, um, so um, each, each line on here is a neural response from an individual neuron, um, and each little dot is when it's spiked, okay? And this kind of thing on top, this histogram is just the sum of all of the spikes underneath it. So that's kind of the sum over many trials on the average over many trials. So, um, so this is the case where you know, it, it's not your birthday, but all of a sudden someone comes along and gives you a present anyway, and you experience this great burst of reward. You're like, okay, so this is the, the and this is a dopamine one. So the, the dopamine neurotransmitter is very important for reward. Also other functions too. Um, these are, by the way, the, the neurons that die in Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, you know, people think of it as being a problem with movement, right? But these neurons are also very important for reward. So even things that look like they're just doing one thing may be doing more than one thing. Um, so, okay, uh, it's not my birthday. I'm not really expecting much. Oh, someone just gave me a present. Woof, lots of reward. Okay, you see all this fire in here? So this kind of feeling that you experience as an entire person is, uh, is directly, there's a direct neural correlate of it, at least in monkeys, and actually, people have found signals just like this in human fMRI uh, in this part of the brain. Here's a case where it's your birthday, and your, your friend comes along, and you're kind of expecting a card, and then you get the card. Okay? So the time when you actually feel good is when your friend first comes along. You're like, oh, I bet I'm about to get a card. Okay? You're already feeling good the moment you see the stimulus. And then when they actually give the card, you're like, well, that's nice. I kind of expected that. Thank you so much. But you know, the time when I really felt good was when I actually just saw my friend come in the room because I'm like, aha, you know, I'm about to get a card. Um, and here's the case where, uh, you know, you're, you're, so you see, you see a burst of fire, but it doesn't happen at the time when you get the reward. It actually happens when you get the, the time when you get the thing that predicts the reward. Okay? So the key, di the key difference here is the mismatch or match between prediction and expectation. Okay? Um, Here's the case where you have a mismatch. Uh, you, you see, it's your birthday, you see a friend, you think they're gonna give you a card, but they don't. So reward is predicted, no reward occurs. So there's two mismatches here, okay? First of all, um, you know, uh, you, see, um, you see a friend and you're like, oh, I didn't know my friend was gonna come. Oh, now I feel all excited, I'm about to get a card. So you get this, this, uh, this reward, this, reward firing here, 
But then, when you're actually expecting them to give you a code, you don't get anything, and then you actually have a suppression of firing. So I don't know if you can see this, but, but there's a kind of fairly constant baseline level of activation that actually gets dipped down to, to zero or very low temporarily. So here again, so, you know, um, this is the case where uh, the, um, what actually happens minus what you predict is something positive, because something good happens that you didn't predict. Here's the case where what actually happens minus what you predict is something negative, because you really thought that something, you predicted something good, but actually nothing happened. Okay. So, so it goes in both directions. So, so prediction and prediction error is very fundamental uh, in the brain, and a lot of people are very interested in this. They model it computationally. You can build algorithms based out of this kind of thing that do quite a good job of steering around in the world. Um, so, so there's a theory. And it's just a theory, but it's, uh, you know, there's some evidence for it. We're going to have a look at that in a minute. Uh, we'll probably continue this at a different time, but let me just show the beginnings of it. So this is a theory that actually goes all the way back to Helmholtz in the 19th century, and many other people, including Dana Ballard, who was here, um, uh, David Mumford, who uh, is actually a mathematician who won the Fields Medal, but now he works on kind of computational neuroscience, and uh, he's proposed this. But really, it goes back to Helmholtz. Um, that say, well, maybe what the brain is all about is, you know, everybody agrees that the brain makes predictions. No doubt about that, right? We're always, whether it's you know, consciously or unconsciously, explicitly or implicitly, kind of figuring out what's going to happen next. And when something comes along, you often don't even notice that you made a prediction until something comes along that violates that expectation. You know, a lot of kind of slapstick comedy is like that. You know, um, someone's just walking along and whoop, they fall over, and you're like, "Oh, I didn't expect that." Okay. So, um, so, so that so nobody do, nobody disagrees that the brain makes predictions, but the the hypothesis that there is a lot of uncertainty and disagreement about, but also a lot of active research, is that maybe this is actually how the brain encodes the world. Okay. So, maybe maybe what the brain actually is not just that the brain cares about predictions. But the brain actually represents things in terms of predictions, which is which is a kind of stronger statement. Okay? So, so you remember how uh, if if the prediction and the expectation match, then basically nothing happens, right? So reward predicted, reward occurs. You're like, oh, I'm about to get a card. Well, I do get a card. Okay, well, that's nice. Okay, you don't feel very excited about that. You don't feel very disappointed either. So what? So f as far as this neuron is concerned. Basically, nothing happened. Now, actually, a lot happened. In the world, a lot happened. You predicted a reward, and you got it. Right? That's kind of important. But from the neuron's point of view, if it only cares about prediction error, it didn't make any error at all. So it says, well, you know, I did a very good job of predicting the world, so I'm just fine. I don't need to, um, you know, I didn't learn anything new just now. I don't need to bother neurally representing that. Okay? So there's an argument that says, well, what's a very efficient way of dealing with the world? An efficient way of dealing with the world is, you know, if you already know something, if you already got it right, don't bother with it. Just bother with the stuff that you got wrong. Okay? Deal with that stuff, represent that stuff, and then you've immediately simplified your problem of you know, how to deal with this big, complicated world. Just deal with the things that you're getting wrong and concentrate on that, and that could be quite efficient. So that's essentially what this idea of predictive coding says. So, You've got some input, and um, you've got some higher level thing that basically says, aha, I either predicted that input or I didn't. So the, the higher level thing sends down some kind of prediction as feedback, literally as feedback. It's typically believed this is, would be feedback from a higher cortical area to a lower cortical area. Or in this case, in this model, it's from V1 to a, um, a thalamic area, LGN. Um, so the prediction gets sent back, and then some kind of difference operation, some error detector says, does my prediction match my, uh, match my input? And uh, if they match perfectly, then you basically get zero. Right? Just like when you had a, a prediction, uh, just, like, um, just like here, you've got prediction and reward matching, and uh, nothing happens. Now, in this case, this is actually not so much with reward. This is just with any kind of input. Okay? This is saying, you know, I expect 
to um, to look out at the world and see, you know, that there's quite a few people in this room, and then I go and look at that. I said, you know, well, if that's really, if I, my brain's got that right, my brain doesn't really need to waste time representing stuff that it's just fine with. You know, it should care more about stuff that, you know, maybe someone just came in or maybe someone just went out. Okay? So, so this actually says, and it's making kind of a strong claim, it says that predicted input should literally get nulled out. And, 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 the, and the only thing that gets passed forward could be this error signal, the difference between the top-down prediction and the bottom-up input. So this is the key idea of predictive coding. If you, read, uh, if you read around a bit, you'll probably see descriptions of predictive coding that make it seem a lot more complicated than that, but it's actually not. Okay? That, that's actually what's, what's going on. And, um, and amazingly, Helmholtz, so you probably know Helmholtz's name is like a famous physicist, but he also kind of dabbled a bit in psychology, and in his dabble, it came up with actually a, a theory people are still talking about more than a century later, so he was doing pretty well. Um, so, uh, now, there's some, there's some aspects of this idea that seem to make a lot of sense. It certainly seems like it would, it would um, be a very reasonable and efficient way to represent the world. But there's other aspects of, um, of actual neural data that maybe don't quite seem to fit to it, what maybe they do. And here's where you know, we're going to, we'll probably talk about that more next time. But, um, so this is a, ni a, a nice paper from Sabina Kastner et al. Uh, from actually quite a, quite a few years ago now, looking at um, attention, but also expectation. And I think this is one of the early papers to look at this in, in human fMRI. So, if you look at uh, um, if you look at attentional signals before the stimulus has even come on, okay. So like if I say to you, hey, there's about to be someone with a red hat walking in the room, press a button as soon as you see them. Your sort of red hat detectors, whatever that means, okay, are sort of sending this signal from higher level cortex to lower level cortex, look for red things, look for red things, look for red things. Okay? And your, your red responsive neurons in these lower areas are actually going to have an elevated baseline activation before anybody even walks into the room, okay? before there's any stimulus. So just from this expectation, uh, there's, um, there's extra activation. So that's what, that's what this is showing here. Um, whereas, uh, and this actually matches quite closely with, um, with the activation when there's actually a real stimulus there. So, so it looks as if there's this sort of top-down template being sent uh, that produces an, an extra uh, baseline of activation. But um, okay, well we're actually running out of time, so we're going to talk more about this uh, in subsequent uh, sessions. But but I want to, I hopefully this has kind of conveyed the, the kind of key idea of what expectation is, what prediction is, and how they how they maybe might relate to each other. Now on uh, okay, I'm going to skip this. We'll talk about this next time. Okay, on Thursday I'm actually going to be out of town on Thursday. Um, on Thursday, with great uh, thanks and gratitude to uh, Dan Cole. Uh, we're going to be doing another of these computer practicals. So again, this is only for people who are enrolled in the class. Although I think now we've gone to the point where most of the people in this room actually are enrolled. That's my one. Uh, so just you know, for space limitations. Uh, so you know, we've been looking at the, the Hatchby data. Uh, so so far, we've done um, you know, kind of surfing around some of the time courses, doing some basic pre-processing. But now the next thing is how do you say when the stimuli actually happened? And then once you've done that, you can actually say, aha, what's the activation listed by the stimuli? So that's what we're uh, going to kind of poke around in the data a bit on, uh, on Thursday. And so you basically say, here's when the stimuli happened, here's what they lit up. Now half of the key message of this class has been, you know, just seeing what lights up is actually not in itself a very interesting question. But it is a key step along the way. Okay, so you're going to learn um, you're going to learn some of the basics uh, of of how to get that first step, and it's only after you've been able to see which areas light up that you can then start to ask questions about you know, or well, what's making them light up? Is it actually a pattern? Is it you know, is there some structure to it? All these kind of questions. So uh, anyway, so so uh, have a good time on Thursday. Thank you very much in advance for doing it, and uh, you know, send me your, uh, if you have questions or if you'd like to meet by your project. Please ping me and we'll continue to discuss that.
So it's my very lengthy email said, I'll be gone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Marius. That was yeah. not a very lengthy email. Really? I thought it was very confusing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm going to be gone. Yeah. 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 Thursday. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I have, he's a pretty nice guy. I've <laughs> interacted with him on several days. I can't oh, yeah. send both yeah. of you in at the I same actually time. Presented oh, yeah. Oh, you presented it. Oh, you went to that yeah. thing. So yeah. she yeah. is, yeah. and like, she oh, okay. can go and grab and play through. Oh, nice. And well, that's you just nice worry about, it's only there for like two hours on Friday, you just worry about yourself and Calvin. That's the ideal situation. If she isn't, then, yeah, like, I mean, yeah. It's just never do anything the water, right? It's just not the fruit on Friday. It's Friday, it's the small place. I love that line. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's, that's, that's so the big thing. Right? Yeah. If she's not, I mean, I'll just tell you. If she's not, I'll have her watching Calvin. Yeah, she can, yeah. She can, she can calibrate and watch. Month, she just doesn't know how to set up completely, but she can chair everyone. So I'm pretty sure she'll be fine. Just let me know. Yeah. I know I could post it. And I'm only posting notes with every all of the information, I guess. Yeah, I know. It's insane. I mean, Tommy will be there all He's and then really um, whoever uh, does yeah, the yeah, water for the weekend, uh, like, I'm just going to bring yeah, a bottle out of one of the biggest. Uh, Shannon can grab the bottles. Oh. Uh, she can go in and grab the bottles and everything. Uh, and Juliana will yeah, hang out and she will place. Place. also bleach all the wine, so don't even worry about your wine. And yeah. Shannon can wrap your pack yeah. on yeah. Friday, so yeah, you yeah, cool. wrap no, up I'm, I'm right. tape is, uh, So, yeah. Awesome. Pretty much, it's just like the final steps of, like, priming. Well, yeah, yeah, I also I had one, one question about that. Um, oh, yeah. Also, also like some recent work by Mokshi. Yeah, yeah, I know him from when yeah. I was at MGA. Well, yeah, right. He's got yeah. some... Uh, no, no, no. Oh, I mean, like... Yeah, I mean, that's it. I know. Oh, I'm going to see him in Vermont for a while. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? So, yeah. It's a whole book about that. Wait, do you have any in your pillowcase? Yeah, I know Mokshi, actually. Yeah, I mean, I've seen him for a few years. Yeah, we were emailing him. Like, Tom, there's like a bunch of stuff going on in Rochester that I'm getting involved with. Comes in and how we make predictions with, about like, um, you know relatively impoverished well, visual information. But like, I work yeah. in a special oh, yeah. so it's for the yeah, yeah. yeah. trafficking yeah. campaign. Yeah. And like, All right, I got it, Jeff. Oh, yeah. Things. yeah. You guys later. So the thing that um, they, so yeah. so I mean, uh, I mean, I don't really they want to talk about it. Like, so much power. So like, like, I mean, I'm not brain based. I have a lot of brain based. Yeah, brain based. I mean, I also have some dragons. You know, I do that. It's a 